Is it kicking? Yeah, she's, she's kicking. kicking. You can feel like she's just sort of moving around. You can feel that what's hard right there. Today, when I got a pedicure, every time um, the woman would tickle my feet, she would kick. How many months are you in? 32 weeks. Mm -hmm. So just about two more months to go. Until little girl. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not ashamed. Breast pump, ex the breast pump accessory kit. Much needed. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think I'll know until it's really happening how it's really gonna go down. Maybe I should be more afraid of the childbirth at this point, but I think I'm a little bit nervous about um, how all this breastfeeding is gonna go. Yes, I would like to have a natural childbirth and I hope I will be able to breastfeed and everything is going to go according to the plan without a hitch, but I know that that's not the way things really work in real life. I don't expect to be the best, the perfect breastfeeder. Or I don't. I, I know that there's going to be like bumps in the road, um, but that's really been my focus. I would be like enrolled in school and working, so it might not work out the way I might like want it to, but it'll still like happen. I'll still breastfeed like the days I can, and whenever I have to go to work or something. Maybe I could try the formula. If someone is having trouble with breastfeeding, I think I don't really want to make them feel worse about it because they made that decision to to feed, you know, from a formula. But it's not a choice that I would make for myself. watched it during one of our classes. It was phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, clutching, clutching in the head, they actually pull their head up and look at, look, you know, catch their mom's, you know, face and start guiding themselves. It's pretty impressive. My husband and I are both biologists and breastfeeding is what you should do. I mean, it's the most natural thing. You don't want to him try it? Tell him I try. We were hoping that he would that he would um, find his find way. His way. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> quite a long time. Sometimes. Uh, but whatever you like. But he's hungry. Whoa, whoa, whoa.
That was. He found it, but he hasn't latched on yet. Uh, you sure you don't want to give him a help? What do you suggest? Good job. See? Mm -hmm. This is not that easy, but you did it. You latched. You feel it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is a good latch. We are oh, breastfeeding. Okay. <laughs> he actually just latched on. I need a little bit more time. Transfer. Uh, before I go, I like to give him the vitamin shot. Okay. Yeah. I already let your husband check everything. Just need the old right side in that finger print here. Thank you. It's your latch. Okay. okay. Hopefully within a day or two my milk will come in. So that could be the only bump that in the road because he appears to be latching fine. It's just the hope that the milk will come in. Because that could be the other limiting factor. I was trying to pump my breast last night because I was worried that my breasts weren't ready. Like I wasn't expressing milk, so just to kind of stimulate the milk, I started breast pumping. And I think that's what started the contractions. Barbara's the head nurse and she said she was bringing the baby. And that was like almost an hour ago. How time flies. So, the baby hasn't eaten since one. I haven't fed her since one o'clock. Maybe, maybe they're feeding him. They're no, feeding I, him. I clearly said. I'm not gonna say in sound mind and body because I wasn't, but I said, I don't want her to be bottle fed. I'm breastfeeding her. Yes, if, if she takes the bottle, she, don't want to, to she won't this. feed. So I clearly said that, so. I swear I'm gonna raise hell if they bottle feed her. The ABB out there. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I was asking for the hospital intercom. <laughs> hey honey, I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah, we you know we had to warm her up and then bathe her. And then I went to lunch and came back as soon as I walked in there like, Miss Crawford is asking for her baby. I'm like, okay, let's go get her dress and get her hair. Temperature is okay now, she's fine. But I think she's going to want to be fed, huh? Yes. Look how different she looks. <laughs> All right, after a bath. <laughs> but this is your baby. Is she really? Well, you can mm. check. Let's just check and make sure, right? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I think she's mine. <laughs> she's yours, yeah. <laughs> Getting a little heavy. They're gonna produce milk. Huh? They're starting to feel a little tight in the bottom. Mm -hmm. If we feed her for my third nipple, I think it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. I'm not expressing any milk. I should have started stimulating it much earlier. No, she's looking for breast. Watch, watch her back. You get comfortable first. Tap, tap. Mm -hmm. 
Like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh -huh. Make sure she latch. I expected it to be good. I still feel positive about it. It kind of only just reconfirms why I want to. Why I wanted to do this. So. Let's see in two days when <laughs> I'm when I'm going through the engorgement and it won't be as pleasant. But I guess mentally I prepared myself for that part too. So. I think that I can breastfeed her till kingdom come. And I think that she can, she's, there's still the possibility of her, God forbid, coming out bad because she doesn't have her father in her life. And everything that I've ever done that I think I'm doing to help her and, and to have that connection with her will be in vain because she'll still want her father. Every woman has a reason why she breastfed. You can ask a woman all day, why are you breastfeeding? And in my opinion, she'll tell you, oh, it's good for the baby and studies show and women in England do this. And, and then she can say that. And I'm thinking she's lying. Why is she breastfeeding? Because there's lots of things that are good for us. That don't necessarily mean we do them. Breastfeeding is one of those things that you have to, you have to be ridiculously competitive to do, I think. You have to be almost mean about it. You know, you're telling the baby, you will breastfeed. You know, <laughs> I will do this. You know, there's a certain kind of push, a uh, oomph that goes with breastfeeding that, you know, the off chance your child might not be fat when he gets older is not gonna do it. Hey, yo, 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 what are y'all doing with the cameras? Hey, I'm from the help center. Yo, what the fuck is that? You look cute today. <laughs> Tell me what your plan is. No, I'm trying to figure this out. You just might be that determined, Crystal, I am. to have your baby in the morning and go back <laughs> to school in the school. afternoon. I, I hope it can happen. You might just be that woman, so. <laughs> Take off the weekend. Come on a Friday, have the whole weekend. The, back yeah. to school on Monday. Back to school on Monday. I'm trying. That's it. How does breastfeeding fit into that? Well, there's the breast pumps, you know, the storage bags and stuff. Can make it work. Do you fear that you may not be able to return to school if you breastfeed? I'm determined to go back to school. <laughs> That's good. You're gonna need it. You're gonna need the determination. So here, this. <laughs> you can put that in your shirt if you want. But Montgomery glands. Do you remember anything about Montgomery glands? I remember that from the mama classes. Yeah, I see yeah. you looking at it. Do they have like a set? Keep going. And that the baby like recognizes that from the womb. Keep going. So they like latch on a little easier. And that's exactly what Montgomery glands do. It's amazing okay. and awesome stuff it is. And you do, <laughs> you do listen to me. Of course, that's what I'm here for. I have to listen to learn. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. Hi Kim, my name is Karen Block. Uh, I'm calling because uh, I gave birth to a baby girl about two weeks ago. And um, she was a little premature, and she needs um, some prescription um, human milk fortifier. And I understand that my prescription plan does not um, have her listed as one of my dependents. Okay. All right, well, um, then I'm going to go ahead and, and get the prescription and then um, hope to be reimbursed. <laughs> so, great. Thank you so much, Kim. You too. Bye-bye. Right. The main issue right now is not that she's not getting enough food. I appear to have enough milk. She's actually nursing really well. But because she was a few weeks early, she's considered premature and therefore was born a little bit under the, under the weight that they would like to see, which is something that I have some issues with because it seems like you can't compare a full-term baby that is born somewhere between six and nine pounds 
with uh, a baby that was born four weeks early and was almost six pounds. It seems almost like she's, she's already starting at a disadvantage and, and she doesn't really, isn't really given a fair chance to catch up. The other one? Breastfed babies tend to gain weight initially uh, more slowly, but then they eventually speed up. And so, so Chris and I feel that if we continue to breastfeed her without the supplement, she probably will catch up. She probably would. But um, we don't want to toy around with her health. So we're going to go ahead and follow the pediatrician's advice. When pediatricians make certain recommendations, you are kind of on the hook to follow certain child welfare guidelines because if you don't, you know, like potentially they could call child protective services on you if they feel that you're not doing what you're supposed to take care of your child. And um and of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I would never, you know, put my child in, in danger, not certainly not, um, not consciously, but, uh, but it is something that, that I don't know how many people really think of, but I, it, it, it does cross my mind that you, you do have, um, certain authorities that you have to answer to. The other night, I took Mateo from the bedroom and I took him out to the living room and I tried to, to rock him and just get him to go back to sleep. And he would just shake and just go into just this anxious little tantrum. We were interpreting it that he just wasn't getting enough. My mom and my husband, Lawrence, both have expressed concerns about his lack of, of peeing and that he's not getting enough. And so it'll usually go a while. And if he's really fussy, then they've kind of both stepped in and said, you know, you shouldn't feel bad if you have to supplement. Just before... I had him and actually experienced the breastfeeding. I was very optimistic about it being really positive that I was gonna just jump into this and it was gonna, I mean, I was of course very naive <laughs> think that it was gonna work out even though everyone has told me that they've had issues with breastfeeding that I thought, well, I'll be, you know, I'll just look for cues and I'm going to try to try to just devote all my time to that. The hospital provided us with a with a bag um, of bottles and and small of small bottles of formula and and caps and nipples uh, that we could use if, if we wanted to. And given that they provided us with a with a formula, um, a particular specific formula, not just formula. Um, and he seemed to re respond okay to it. There weren't any adverse effects. There, it didn't, it removed a lot of the anxiety of standing, standing in front of a wall of different brands and, and formulas of formula and, and, and saying, what am I gonna get? We weren't at all set up for doing any formula. We hadn't, I hadn't researched it at all because I wasn't gonna use formula. And I think that the fact that I used it 
in the hospital that day when you weren't even there because of the concerns that they were they were giving me and then they provided it it like set it up that yeah it made it so much easier because I'd already given it to him I told him when he came in and you were like oh really right <laughs> and she did the same that thing for me the other night you know um, when he had his little bout in the middle of the night and Colleen was asleep in the bedroom and I decided to to, to open up a bottle of crack and, and, and give it to him <laughs> um, I told her in the morning and she said she had the same condescending attitude. It's just like, oh, really? Without without asking me? And I said, <laughs> I made a decision as his parent. And and it seemed to, to uh, alleviate the situation. And again, I'm I, I think both of us are in in, in a agreement that we hope it's a, a, a short term option. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really been good. The breastfeeding has okay. been very good. Her father gives her breast milk from the bottle sometimes, but it doesn't always have the same effect. Um, sometimes she really just wants the breast, and that's what makes her feel at ease, and it calms her down. <laughs> fear around non-biological motherhood, I think, in culture. And it plays out with regard to lesbian couples in ways that are different from the way it plays out in relation to surrogacy or in relationship to adoptive parenting. Um, but definitely, like, the whole sort of scare tactic of, of gay marriage and how they'll be bringing children up in a family that doesn't have a mother and a father. So I think the idea that the non-biological mother is also going to breastfeed, can induce some of the same kinds of panic. Like, there's, there's a feeling that there's something unnatural about it. Whereas, one, I think one of the things that felt most triumphant to me about my lactation is that it was completely natural. I just put the child to my breast and my breast produced milk. The body needs two things in order to lactate the female body and being pregnant isn't one of them. One is hormones and the other is stimulation. And just by being around uh, Luki, I had a lot of the pregnancy hormones and I had the baby, which provides exactly the right kind of stimulation. And in fact, what I did was I just latched her on three minutes aside twice a day and within five days I had milk. And it, when it happened, I was just incredibly moved. I felt like, Mentally, my brain recognises that this is my daughter and it's really nice to know that my body also recognises that this is my daughter. It was really powerful to me that I did it and it's kind of amazing to me that it has stayed even though she doesn't do it every day. It's still there, it hasn't, it hasn't gone away. It's, it's, it's just really nice. Come up here and show us how you give the baby side. <laughs> there we go. I didn't know how long it would be that we would nurse. We would nurse, but um. I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. I, I. It became clear to me that it wasn't going to stop anytime soon. After a few months, I realized how important breastfeeding was to Violet just how much it gave her a sort of anchor and center and sense mm -hmm. of comfort. And I just couldn't imagine taking that away from her. I, I wouldn't say it's like pure self-sacrifice, not at all. 
um, because it's so nice to feel so close to your child and it's so nice to um, be able to have this thing that helps you structure your life to be close to your child when there's so many forces in today's world that, you know, make it difficult, you know, especially for working mothers, but also I think for stay-at-home moms, there's just so much going on. And we're all so fast, we're all running around so much, and I know I'm that way. So, um, you know, breastfeeding has been really good to slow me down, and I think you have to slow down to really bond. One side. Yes. I think it is a little difficult for both of us to realize that there actually is just some sort of innate human biological wisdom to a certain style of division of labor, even if it doesn't need to be such an austere division, of course, and we're not doing any type of austere division, but having the realization that, oh, this actually works in this way that makes sense. But I think you have to really be careful of biological determinism because, I mean, okay, there are differences and that's objective. And yes, some, because there are differences, some sort of division of labor mm -hmm. is going to happen, even if mm -hmm. there were differences. Mm -hmm. um, they're like, you know, I don't know, a good example would be two moms or two dads who have a child, like, you know, or two dads where neither one of them is breastfeeding. Like, that would be an interesting thing to look at because, you know, there is definitely uh, a case to be made for one person focusing on one thing and one person focusing on another so that you could kind of go deeper on that thing. But, like, what that thing is, like, what the roles are, that may not be so biologically determined. Like, yes, it's biologically determined that, you know, generally speaking, women can breastfeed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I suppose there are men who can too, if they take, what is it, they have to take prolactin or something. Anyway, so, but still, a woman, you know, like, what is the role of the man then, if the woman is breastfeeding? Is it to have the job and bring home the bacon? Is it to do the housework so that the woman can breastfeed and have the job and bring home the bacon? Whatever may be possible and justifiable and appropriate and interesting and progressive, you know, and, you know, we like to think about those things and we feel like we know that that's all out there. What actually happened when we got involved with this situation is that we wanted not totally traditional things, but we wanted things that were resonant with things that were traditional that beforehand we may have regarded as, like, backwards and been like, I would never want that, like ah, like, that would never happen, or, like, I, I, before, I'm not even, not just you, like, I might have been like, sure, I'd be open to just being a stay-at-home dad, like, why not, you know, it's the 21st century, like, that doesn't mean anything, you know, but when I found, when I found out that we were pregnant, I quintupled my income in, like, three months, <laughs> do you know what I mean, after being this, like, layabout rock and roll dude, you know what I mean, for, like, 10 years, and just being like, oh, I don't know, man, you know what I mean, like, I was like, oh, we're pregnant, <laughs> And it was just like, immediately I jumped like five tax brackets. Do you know what I'm saying? And that's just, that felt, it felt like almost biological to me to do that. Do you know what I mean? At least instinctual. And I think you had a very instinctual drive to sort of not do that and like scale things down and like keep your job. Your values factored into your decisions. You're like, well, I'm not going to become a stay-at-home mom. I've built up this thing. I have a career. I'm going to do all of that. But I'm going to sort of scale it down so that I can participate in Violet's life in this way. And that aspect of it was resonant with traditional values that prior to becoming pregnant, I don't think either of us held. Yeah, well, it definitely, yeah, the reality of it, definitely. What we are leading towards is a kind of biological feminism where a woman is fully engaged with her own biology, not as a form of determinism that pulls her back to being barefoot and pregnant, but which pushes her forward or leads her forward into a space where she can be fully in the world and fully in her body simultaneously. And the implications of that, although it could be rejected by some feminists as being essentialist and saying, well, no, there's a lot more that women have in common with men than, we, than is different from men, and there's a logic and some usefulness in that point of view as well, there's a much more powerful idea, I think, a much more radical idea, is that the differences that a woman's body brings can begin to soften the edges of our culture. When I'm breastfeeding, there is like no thought 
Like there is no worry. Like that exhale moment and she's okay and nothing else matters. That moment when she's breastfeeding. It's like a little high. <laughs> like you're high. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I went into a panic about not being able to produce enough milk. So I just thought it'd be good to go to a support group, maybe hearing other moms who are breastfeeding. Can I have everybody's attention? Attention, attention. Can we're going to try to start this. Thank you all for coming to La Leche League. This is, this is probably the biggest meeting I've ever had here. And today's topic is breastfeeding and overcoming difficulties. Actually, that's what every meeting is really about. And if you want to throw out a difficulty you have overcome or one that you are working to overcome now, that would be great. I went into like a panic two weeks ago that I wasn't gonna have enough supply because sometimes she gets like really fussy as if she's not getting anything, like she gets like mad. Um, <laughs> so then I was worried that I wasn't gonna have enough milk. Do you have a lot of milk? You were concerned about milk supply. You sure it's not gushing out and she's trying to control it? It doesn't seem like it's gushing out. Um, when I pump, it just kind of sprays out. I don't know, I, I want to see what, when she nurses later, see what that looks like. Okay. I'm really dismayed when I go to La Leche League meetings or I meet other women who are breastfeeding and they talk about the pumping all the time and about how they're feeding and pumping and the baby's, you know, two minutes old and they're already hooked up to the pump, the pumping addiction. There also seems to be a huge concern in the United States that I just never encountered in Australia of people worried that they're not going to have enough milk. To be honest, I see it as um, this, an assumption that women, women's bodies can't possibly be good enough by themselves and that you need to supplement it, that you need to control it, that it's like unmeasurable and you don't really know. And so therefore there's this like ignorance and there's a fear associated with it. I don't think it's statistically possible that the number of people that we've met that have just said, oh, I didn't have enough milk. You met so many women who didn't have enough milk. It's just impossible. I feel I'm left in a position where I have to somehow be sympathetic or feel sorry for them that they didn't have enough milk. Where and But I'm not left in a situation where they're saying, congratulations, you've really managed to breastfeed and you've given it your all and, and your baby's six months and you're still only breastfeeding, you're not supplementing. What an achievement for you, your baby and society in general. I feel I find that a very awkward and common encounter that I have because I don't feel able to say what I really think, which is... I feel really devastated for you that you're not giving a child breast milk because that would be a judgment on them as a mother. And who knows, maybe they genuinely did, you know, maybe they really, really, really weren't able to breastfeed. I'm a little bit more antagonistic than Loki sometimes. I tend to be like, oh, that must have been really hard for you. Um, whereas, and make it clear that I think that they should have breastfed, whereas, but it's very awkward because it's a politically loaded um, situation. There was a lot of um, pressure from the pediatricians at the hospital that I get a pump immediately right now, do not wait one more second. Because if you don't get a pump, then the world will end. So yeah, I ended up you know, spending the almost $300 on the pump. And, um, and there I was last week trying to pump, thinking I can't believe that I spent $300 on this thing and it doesn't work and it's actually painful. And how are people who are poor and for whom, you know, they are being told that uh, breast milk is free and you can feed your baby breast milk and it's better for your baby, but they can't afford a pump. They can afford a lactation consultant. They might have very demanding jobs that don't let them go to uh, an 1130 La Leche League meeting on a Thursday. I'm very much against the uh, nurse is rolling out the, um, you know, the pump when the mother is, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours postpartum because at that point they don't have a lot of milk. They have enough, but they don't have a lot. And so by expressing milk or pumping milk at that particular point, the only message they're getting is I don't have any milk. So, you know, to say that the pump tells you how much you're producing is nonsense. It tells you how much you can pump. That's not the same thing. We're taught as women to be unhappy with our bodies. So when our bodies don't do things that we think that they ought to be doing, like miraculously provide the right amount of milk for our children the moment they're born, we think the problem is our bodies 
And it's the social system, it's the economic system, it's the structures in place that, and the advice we get. All of those things together can cause lactation failure. And yet we experience that failure as a biological problem when in fact it's a social problem. Now, huh? Want to eat some food now? Mm? I was going natural until about eight centimeters, and then his heart rate dropped, so they had to do an emergency C section. Thank you, I appreciate it. Now I know how to do it. Yes, son, yes. Mommy comes to feed you right now. It's time to feed him, to breastfeed him, is when he's real hungry. Well, we gotta take him out this thing. He was laying straight. No, he was like this. Oh. He latched, but he's not drinking. He's probably not hungry. Okay. Oh, there you go. Yeah, last night I was trying to um, breastfeed, but I started throwing up. So uh, I had to just go back to the nursery so they could take care of him. And, they had to give him formula because I was just too out of it to try to feed him. Actually, I was really sad because it's like I couldn't hold him, couldn't feed him. I was like to the point when I was so drugged up, I didn't even remember holding him after I gave birth. You want to feed him this after this? Or you want to get a new bottle? Hmm? No, you can get them this. That's where you get it from. I get the hungry less from my dad. This nigga's bald eyeballs look crazy. You got a problem with his mouth. I think you want more food. Don't feed him nothing for me. Are you eating that greedy kid? Mm. He's looking at me. We're having a moment. Yo, yo you be hitting my stomach and you forget every time. I do. I definitely be forgetting. I forgot you even got a stomach. Okay, maybe he wants more food. Okay, I'll give you some more food. Give me 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 some more food. I told you, you can't. She said 20 minutes. That's it because you got that medicine. I didn't do 20 minutes. You did 20 minutes. You were sitting there. Well, for, only one. I was laying down there I for like 10 minutes. Tell her, give me a milk is right there. Bottle. Thank you. I hate the bottle. Kevin is just like, he's scared that when the baby breastfeeds that he's not getting enough. Honestly, I don't like giving him the formula. I think the breast milk is better and he like spits up after he drinks the Infamil, so I don't want to give him that, and then it could be like an allergic reaction. So I'd rather breastfeed than give him the baby. Milk. So let's go back this way. Typically, it's the responsibility of the mom who needs who needs WIC to contact WIC uh, within two to three days if after she's delivered. It was always a lot of holding breath up in the air, anticipation. What's she gonna ask for? She gonna ask for a full formula package, some formula package, no formula, you know. And, you know, a lot of times they we got full formula packages. Breastfeeding didn't work for me in the hospital. Formula feeding is going pretty good, but not too good, because he's getting constipated with the formula. That's why I came to change the formula for him. How many formula changes have we gone through already? No, just um, from Similac to Infamil. And this one now. Do we confuse you at WIC? Do we confuse you in by giving you formula? Do we confuse the, the amount of uh, attempts or even effort that should be put into breastfeeding by saying, if you don't do well, there's this formula here for you? Some people take it as being confused because that's the first choice to go to is formula. And because some people don't know that much information about breastfeeding. And then some people be afraid to talk to other people. Like, um, you know, since their breast is personal, they wouldn't want other people looking at them or, or talking about it. But no, I wasn't confused.
This is Kevin. Make... This is our only breastfeeding dad. No, no. This it's breastfeeding dad is giving either. problems. Mommy says that when the baby's with him, it's straight, straight breast. But when, it's, when daddy comes around, it's a bottom. Yeah, it takes mad long to pump it. And then he... I don't have a pump. He, no, not pump, but you know what I'm saying. As he latch on. Uh -huh. Yeah, it and then so it's like, like, like 30 minutes. <laughs> and I'm okay. sitting there waiting like... Wait, I want to make Where you want to go? Okay. Wow, we're really I want to go. That's what I asked. Where are we going? I'm Nowhere, but it just sit the so point. I'm I'm not impatient, but you already no, said I'm impatient. He's patient. Oh my god! I'll be like this, and I'll be like, yo, he's not done yet. So, how good have you gotten with hand expression? What do you mean getting the milk out on your own? Oh no, I haven't even he tried. Hasn't? You should start practicing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Start practicing. I mean, you're not looking to, um, you know, make gallons right now, you know, to produce gallons. You're just looking to practice your technique. Some women have gotten so good at it, and I've seen them, that they can, like, shoot milk into little um, containers. Wow. Yeah, that good. I have really been thought about that. But, yeah, that's. A, I think it's a skill that we should all know. I'm not very good at it. But why do you do it? Like, what's the point? Well, because there's three ways to, to get milk mm -hmm. from your body, right? Um, think of a cow, right? Mm -hmm. When you go, you can milk a cow with your hand. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you get to a farmer that needs to have a lot of milk, he uses a machine. You ever seen the cows hooked up to all those machines? Yeah. Well, you know, it kind of works on a small scale for us, too. They have an area for you to... Yeah. Oh, yeah. The way my husband is, um, you know, like I'm his wife. My duty is first to him. And then, you know, like the way he the way he is and the way our relationship is, I didn't want my breastfeeding for him and me wanting to give this time to my baby be on the way of our relationship. And I wanted him to be supportive and to like it and to help me, not to hate it, you know? So my question to the doctor was like, can I breastfeed? And at the same time, can I have my breast be part of my intimate relationship with my husband. When we are having intercourse or an intimate moment, I do not want him to touch there because if the baby wakes up, the first instinct that I have is to put her in my breast. I don't want to have germs on my baby. Buenos dias. If it was your issue, if it was you, how would you do it? Will you tell your husband, hold on, this is my baby's breast now? Will you have, like my friend said, one breast for me and one breast for the baby? Will you be with your husband, then take a shower, and you could breastfeed the baby? What will you do? The ideal breastfeeding mother that we have constructed culturally for ourselves is an asexual mother, and she goes right back to the Madonna and child, the asexual Madonna and child who didn't even have to have sex to have the baby in the first place. And we've inherited this uh, um, ideal of the asexual mother who for some reason can flick a switch at the point of giving birth and wait until she's again in bed with her partner before she's going to flick the switch again and become sexual. And this creates terrible tensions for women around the breast. The breast represents that real boundary between, for us, between maternity and sexuality. And for me, that's a real shame because I think the most sexual breast of all is the lactating breast. People are uh, grossed out by the fact that uh, they have sex and maybe the woman who is breastfeeding will have a milk ejection reflex while uh, having sex uh, or orgasm. And in fact, there are a lot of similarities in what occurs in the mother's body during breastfeeding and what happens during orgasm. If breastfeeding wasn't pleasurable, uh, then that probably would have meant part of the demise of the human race or something like that, that, that we have evolved to, to feel pleasurable um, sensations from breastfeeding, from the oxytocin that is released during breastfeeding so that 
um, we want to do it and that it is supposed to feel good, but that a lot of people are uncomfortable with that because they associate those pleasurable feelings with sex. I remember going out of the room and having him in my breast, and when I changed breasts on him, I had a feeling of when the milk was coming out, and it was a ticklish feeling, and I didn't like it because I, you know, I connected it, the feeling I connected it to when I'm with my husband, and I didn't like it. I think breastfeeding definitely changed your breasts as an erogenous zone for me. Do you know what I mean? There was less, like, stimulation around the breast, especially, like, orally, f you know, f <laughs> from, fear, from me um... in this direction. <laughs> you know what I mean? Be be because it's just, yeah, it changes the whole sort of quality well, of that body part. Yeah, I also have a, a, like, body fluid squeamish thing going on, you know what I mean? We don't have that problem. We have like the opposite problem, just that the breast milk goes everywhere, and so it's really messy. I think that's, yeah. I mean, you just kind of have to take it, like it's going to go everywhere, so you just have to put down some towels or be prepared to change the sheets or whatever, That's and have a shower afterwards. Like, I don't really want to talk about that. <laughs> is what is called the leaky body, sometimes regarded as even the monstrous body, that the female body and the, the problem for Western culture and for Christianity has been that the female body just is more difficult to control. Because it's wetter, it not only menstruates and, the, and it has babies and produces milk, it, it's more chaotic, it changes, it's fluid, and that this has been seen as a problem. Whereas if we were to shift that round and see the body as a virtuous force for good, as part of the energy that links us to the spiritual, the leakiness of the female body is something that makes it even better. I do breastfeed in public a lot. I use a nursing cover. Maybe it's my years of Protestant upbringing. <laughs> and, you know, I also need to have that conversation with my husband to see how he feels about it. I don't, we haven't really discussed if he's all right with me just sort of whipping it out wherever. I guess I have like read about men who feel very proprietal about their wife's breasts and feeling that they've been displaced while she's breastfeeding. Um, I haven't really been bothered by that. I think that oftentimes the, the, the perception is that women should not show their breasts in public because breasts are kind of like penises. They're not supposed to be shown in public and that men imagine that women think of their breasts as penises and breastfeed in public on purpose sort of to be publicly sexual in a way that they want to be, but, but, but feel they can't be. Men do, act, in fact, urinate in public all the time, but nevertheless. You know, we have a, a neighbor upstairs. Uh, I'm just, I think it's just a shy thing. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm a shy person, so therefore I get shy around people who are exposed. So I get very nervous about, like, getting, you know, looking at, at her at the wrong time. I, I, I don't want to put her in the position that I'm looking at. I know she doesn't care, but it's all in my mind. So I, I've never, you know, because I, a lifetime of never seeing it is why uh, I, I can, you know, if you, of course you grow up with it, it's, it's nothing. But I didn't grow up with it, you know. I didn't, a couple times in my life I ever see a, a woman. But you don't have any issue with it. Issues, no. I, I'm, I have an issue that I have, uh, I have any embarrassment attached to it. That's all. Or the fact that I am uncomfortable around 
uh, a woman, or I can't, I don't feel relaxed when someone's breastfeeding. It's not my, it's not my feelings. It's not how I feel. It's how the lack of, of just a childhood and, and, and adolescence of never seeing it, it's just stuck with you. It, it never uh, will necessarily be, feel normal to see, but perfectly find it 100% acceptable. I mean, I, I would think that would, that would help. What about restaurants? I mean, I think it's polite to have, like, that hooter hider in, in, at a restaurant. The baby is eating and you're eating. Everybody's eating. Yeah. But I think in this culture, it's, it's still about manners in that sense. It, it, most people are like me, and they're embarrassed by it, and it may disrupt their meal. There's this perception that men don't like breastfeeding breasts. And yet there's this whole genre of lactation pornography, where women shoot their milk across rooms. But I would get emails from various women who would write that I would like to induce lactation for reasons, for, for my own reasons. That's how they often put it. If they kept writing me back, I wouldn't answer again because I'm not interested in helping go-go dancers uh, lactate and spray milk over the customers. And there's a wonderful scene in a lactation porn video that I have where I call it the battle of the hand jobs because a woman's lying on her back and she's hand expressing and milk is spraying up and there's a man straddling her and he's also hand expressing you might say <laughs> and he comes on her as you know in many many porn movies that's classic to do and it's lovely because they're smiling at each other and laughing and they're spraying each other at the same time but he's long since over by the time she's just continuing on with her you know spray of milk well, I suppose what the lactation pornography teaches us in a way is that there is a phallic element to the breast. And you do see that in some of the literature as well in cultural studies research around breastfeeding and what it means to us that part of the fear culturally of, of breastfeeding is that the mother's body does have a phallic potential, that the man can also be receptive sexually, not only the dominant party. So it it evens out the playing field somewhat to, to think of the breast as being perhaps phallic, but perhaps an even more interesting way would be to think of the penis as breastly. That might be even more fun. I don't know at what point we're going to stop formula supplementation. Um, for now, I think we're going to keep it as an option, but it's not um, something that I want to really have take over. And I had to really process the whole idea of giving my baby formula um, long and hard. Like somehow I, I was going to be judged by a mythical mother's court for failing to breastfeed my baby properly. I wonder if um, cave women felt uh, <laughs> guilty if one of their babies, um, for whatever reason, had trouble latching on. Did the other cave women chastise that, that cave woman because they had a baby that wouldn't latch on? Would that baby die? Or would they simply say, well, this baby just wasn't strong enough and then walk away and not feel guilty about it? So we are going to an, uh, an ear, nose, and throat doctor to have Mateo's uh, frenulum, the little membrane underneath his tongue, examined to see if he's potentially tongue-tied to aid in his, in his uh, suckling. Some of the, the signs of, of a child being tongue-tied, I was trying to avoid seeing those in him. I, I certainly didn't want to see there being anything wrong with my child. I'd rather fix something in myself than, than in him. 
I've heard of a couple of cases where it was a couple months and it turned around and they're they started having a nice supply of breast milk, you know, trying all of these different things. So that's that's my hope and that's why I, I don't want to give up right now. Hi, how are you? Hi. Hi, Dr. Nice to meet you. Hi, Dr. Nice to meet you. This is Mateo? Yes. That's great. How old is he? <clears throat> four weeks. He's four weeks. Okay. So how is breastfeeding going? Um, not good. I have low milk supply, mm -hmm. and we went and saw Dr. Gabay on Friday, and she assessed me um, and gave me some some things to do. Like I'm, I've been taking herbal supplements to try to increase my milk, and I've just started taking Domperidone. Mm -hmm. But she had looked at his, um, well, looked at his latch, and he. He gets really sleepy when he's on. Um, and she said that it looked like he had um, potentially had some tongue tie, like the, the, there was, the membrane was a little tight underneath, but wanted it to be checked out by, by you. Did you see a lactation consultant as well, or just Dr. Lepe? No, I've, I've spoken with a lactation consultant over the, just on the phone. Oh, okay. um, but no one else has seen me other than Dr. Gabay. Our pediatrician had, because the first couple of weeks he wasn't gaining any weight, mm -hmm. um, and then we really started supplementing mm -hmm. to, put, to put on weight, but she had checked out the latch and thought that he had a good latch, that that wasn't the problem. Okay. But. There are three components to um, the way babies transfer milk uh, when they're breastfeeding. One is the roof of the mouth, one is the mandible or jaw, and the other is the tongue or the mobility of the tongue. So this is the roof of the mouth and this is the tongue, and the tongue has to lift up to the roof of the mouth and, and pull back, be able to move all the way back to transfer the milk. Uh, and the breast or the teat should just be sitting between right up, up against the roof of the mouth and it shouldn't move at all. And then once it's in place, then the tongue can move and sort of pull in the milk from the breast. Uh, and when there's friction, that's what causes pain. So when babies have tongue tie, it's usually a component, or what's called tongue tie. It's more really when babies have difficulty breastfeeding. It's often because of those three parts together. So for example, there are some babies who have literal tongue tie all the way to the tip of their tongue and they can't get their tongue out of their mouth, but they can breastfeed, which is which is interesting. It's rare, but it happens. I've seen it. Uh, and then there are other babies who have, you can barely even see uh, an attachment of the tongue underneath, but their palate is so high they can't reach it. And so I usually explain it by saying your baby's having difficulty getting, for his, getting his tongue to the roof of his mouth. If the baby has a tongue tie, and the mother hasn't been shown the best possible latch. And if she has a, say, an average or below average milk supply, and a below average milk supply should still be good enough. But if you add all these things together, then you've got a real problem. Yeah. Do you see it? Yeah. Do you think that's enough to be a problem? Well, it's actually <laughs> the amount of tongue tie doesn't necessarily predict how much trouble he's okay. going to have. It's really his anatomy. And so and his palate is very high. Could it, but it could potentially help. Yeah, okay. there's a very high chance. Of it. Okay. All right, we're all ready. Okay, here we go. I can move quickly, yeah. Uh, it feels different? I can feel a difference, yeah. So there he goes. That when he slows down a little, you'll see it's a deep, uh, it's like kind of a, it's a two-stage movement. Yeah. Yeah. And at four weeks, you still have a really good shot at increasing the okay. supply. See, now there he's doing it. Oh. 
all we want to do is make sure that his tongue doesn't heal in the same position it was before. Okay. Now he's he's a trooper. He is like, I am gonna do this. You know, some babies will just pull off yeah. and just take a break, and he's like, I am gonna power through. <laughs> One of the things we don't we don't know, and we never will know at this point, is. If for some reason his tongue tie was identified day one in the hospital and released then, mm -hmm. would he have been able to latch in a way that stimulated your body to pull in a milk supply that we don't currently have? Yeah. And that's just one of those questions we'll never really know. Um, but it is a possibility for some women, they really need that early regular milk st stimulation and milk removal to kind of drive that process. So we're basically just trying to do everything we can now to, to try to make up for that not happening. So obviously, it's not that there's a whole bunch of milk in there that he can't get. No. So <laughs> that's, that's hard in a way, because if there was a whole bunch of milk, he might be able to surf off it. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a big issue right now because he is having trouble coordinating swallowing. So if you had a whole bunch of milk, he'd probably be just choking. So okay. that's so the that's the flip we side. Can, maybe so. we can build these up together. At the yeah, as his skill time. increases, hopefully your supply will increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've never seen it, but I, I'm guessing that when other women pump, it's just like, is it just massive flowing out? Well, it's the not... fact is that, you know, if you give him a tablespoon or a teaspoon of your milk every day, mm -hmm. that means a lot. Yeah. Because there are so many live cells, digestive enzymes, immune Great. factors. All of that is in, in nothing else that you could give him. I'm spending at least an hour and a half every day pumping to, um, to supply breast milk to my baby. And it's a bit of a frustrating process because um, I have to do it at the same time every day or approximately the same time. And it's very difficult to do that, especially with my haphazard schedule. So I find myself um, being late to almost every meeting and saying, oh, sorry, I'm late. But the fact is that I was in my office pumping. It's just, that's the way that I have to maneuver it so that I don't um, wind up giving people way too much information about what's going on with my life. It makes me feel a little bit like I'm shortchanging both my career and my kid. I'm an educated woman. Um, I'm from a generation of feminists who are supposed to be able to do it all. We're supposed to be super moms and super career women. Um, that's what our predecessors in the feminist movement have been able to carve out for us. But with that also comes um, the, uh, the idea that we want to be attached to our babies. We've been told that breastfeeding is the best thing for our babies. Um, that it will that we it will result in healthier babies, babies with higher IQs, babies that uh, have a better bond with their families. Um, that in in every way, breastfeeding is better, and um, and this is I think a relatively new movement. Not that long ago, at least thirty years ago, um, mo mothers were being told the opposite that maybe formula was better, that it was going to free you of the, the bondage of breastfeeding and having to be tied to a baby all the time. And um, I think it's just a, it's a pendulum that goes back and forth and we're still trying to find um, what is that balance. my membranes those little white uh, uh, plasticky things on the yellow part um, those wear out and if they don't lie flush with the yellow part then you don't get as good suction it's one of those um, 
secret things that I learned about pumping. You have to replace those about once every a month or something like that. So all of a sudden you're not getting as much milk and it's because the memories have worn out. Go figure. See, this one's sort of not really flush. There's a tiny little gap. So I probably will not, will not get as much as I probably, as, as I could. I don't want to be filmed pumping um, because it's a, uh, I feel like the whole setup is sort of a, I, I feel like a cow. Basically, I feel like a cow. I sit here and I go moo. Two ounces, exactly. Every time, no matter what I do. <laughs> and then to, to get every, Every drop that's on the side of the, the vial, I actually behave as if it were, uh, if I'm doing some wet chemistry in the lab. Try and get every last drop. And I wait for it to sort of well up right there and get that last bit. Liquid gold. I have to say that whenever I see it like this, I, uh, I'm fascinated by the fact that I, I can make food. I, I can sustain a human life um, for an entire year on this stuff alone. Of, I mean, except that I, I can't, um, I haven't been able to make enough, but, but that this is perfectly suitable food and I make it by virtue of just um, being a mother. Um, that's pretty amazing. I didn't know what to expect being um, the breadwinner for the family. I'm working with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders in this school. Um, it wouldn't be good <laughs> for, a, for a child to come in and see their librarian pumping breast milk. I've always thought that public schools should have daycares in them. There are so many mothers working in public schools. They should just have childcare on site. There's a lot of talk about family values, but when you make it difficult on families to be together, <laughs> and you know, I, I don't really see how those two things makes sense, you know, when you say that it's so, family is important, but then, you know, you can't have more than six weeks off for maternity leave, or, you know, you have, you can't have your baby on site for the first year or something. It just, it doesn't make sense to me. Take you to the doctor over there. Because his breathing, I think he has asthma. It's like a little wheezing sound. I, I heard it like a couple of days ago, but I wanted to make sure, like, but was it like a cold or something? Because asthma runs in this family. So I'm going to just get him checked out to see if that's what it is. When I went to work and um, I was explaining Tyler's situation. It was, they kept asking me if I was still breastfeeding. And one month I told him I was because I still was doing both, even though he would still throw up because I was still lactating. So I was like, we're just gonna slowly stop and see how it goes. And then I realized it was best to just completely stop breastfeeding and give him the formula because it'll help him with the acid reflux. So they they try to encourage me. The WIC program tried to encourage me to, you know, breastfeed, but he was still getting sick and I just didn't want to see him hurting. So I kind of just stopped altogether. I think <laughs> me not breastfeeding was kind of a advantage because it would have been very time consuming. I would have had to ask for additional breaks on my job. 
school, I would have missed a lot of information with the time that I would have to be, like, in another room or in bathroom pumping. And I don't know. I think it helped my parents and Kevin when they had to watch him while I was in class because if I didn't store enough milk, would he have eaten? So it kind of worked out for the best now that I think about it. I kind of flirt with the idea of what if Wick didn't get formula? I do, I flirt with that idea often. What if Wick stopped giving formula? And then I look around like, who heard that, you know? <laughs> but we, we, you know, my friends and I, we often talk about that. What if Wick stopped giving formula? Would that force women to breastfeed? And then, you know, and then we kind of stop there because we're wondering, do we want to force women to breastfeed or do we want them to want to, you know? So yesterday he had his six month pediatrician's appointment and he's in the 98th percentile for both weight and length. So he's just growing like gangbusters. He's been on the same soy formula now for about five months. I think the difficulties that we had with breastfeeding have had the greatest toll on Colleen. She really feels like she somehow let her baby down, but that's not the case. Her efforts made it more difficult for the two of us because all of our late night feedings throughout the you know early morning and late night, I would be involved in because she would breastfeed and then when he was done and needed bottle supplementation, I would do that and she would pump so that she was constantly, you know, um, uh, keeping, keeping the, the pressure on the tissue to continue to produce more, more milk. And, and so that, that, uh, that, that, was, that was rough and, and getting up two, three times a night, every night uh, for several months uh, did, did, uh, did have its tolls. I know that she's she's really concerned about the bond issue um, with with breastfeeding and 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 that bond between mom and between mother and child and and I keep reiterating to her that 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 bond is strong that that bond is there he seeks he seeks the breast for comfort and that's the real key thing with respect to that bond uh, sometimes he's hungry to a point where he doesn't want to deal with it and would rather just have a bottle and that should be okay at this point, so. My husband had mentioned that I sh should not be so emotionally attached to the fact that I'm not breastfeeding exclusively. And I think that it's hard for him to understand since he's not a woman. He's not the one who's, who's not able to do this. That makes me question, you know, what kind of parent am I being? You know, how, what kind of bond am I creating with my child? And even though I can think about it logically, like I'm doing all these other things, it's, there's still, it still hurts. And it's difficult when I'm, I think, you know, in my, in my day-to-day -day routine, I can get away from it. But when I'm hanging out with a bunch of other mothers who are of the same mindset of me and, and following, kind of, you know, they really want to have a rich relationship with their child. And we'll spend the day together and they'll be breastfeeding all day long. And it's, it kind of stings to be the only person there that has to pull out a bottle. And then there's always that feeling of, you know, do I need to explain to them? It's not by choice that I'm giving them formula. I would like to be forming this bond with him. So here's my supply of breast milk. I most certainly have more than 50 bags. One sitting, I got eight ounces. I've never gotten that again, but 
That was good. <laughs> that was exciting. Now it's like my OCD project. Like, I keep trying to save the milk. And I think in the beginning, I was so worried about not having enough milk that I was just like paranoid. And now that I have all this milk, I'm like, I don't want to use it. Like, you know, it's just like almost having money. You want to save it for later. <sighs> Let's just waste breast milk. Let's throw it around. Let's do what we feel like with it. Have baths in it. Who cares? You know, or throw it out. Give it to the dog. Who cares? It's just milk. I think having so much expertise around breastfeeding and a sense that there's a, you know, a series of rules that we have to follow to get it right gives us the impression that it's actually quite hard to, to produce milk and that we, you know, we have to follow certain procedures and, and take the right vitamins and eat the right food and get enough sleep and exercise and right, buy the right breast pump or nursing pads, all that stuff that we have to have around us to make it possible to produce what we then call liquid gold. Everything that we do makes it sound really hard and really precious. And that's what I call the scarcity model. I think that we've given ourselves this impression that milk is scarce and that if we get it, it's really precious, that we can't waste it, that we have to treat it with a great degree of reverence that's so special and we have to be incredibly careful about it and mothers have to be very pure to produce the perfect milk for their baby. And that has led us to forget that we have a capacity to produce milk. And in other cultures, I think if there are difficulties, say a mother is unfortunate enough not to be able to produce enough milk or she's sick or perhaps she dies, there'll be someone else in the family, or even her own mother, who will take over. And she may have not lactated for years, but she will lactate again. And that's what I call the plenitude model. It's an idea of abundance around breast milk that we've lost. This is what I posted in August. My husband and I just adopted a baby girl, Naya, now nearly a month old, and we're hoping to find someone local willing to donate breast milk. A lot of people are really willing and, and kind enough to, to make donations when they have milk available, but it is kind of hard to find someone um, who is producing enough you know, to feed their own child and donate on a regular basis to another child. Um, and I didn't realize it would be so hard to find someone to do that. I just assume they're a white couple with a white adopted baby. Like, I really just assumed that. So when they were coming in, I was just like, I wonder if they know I'm black. <laughs> and, you know, you want to believe that it doesn't matter because it's just milk, but it does matter. Like, you know, that's kind of like... It would be kind of naive to think that we, we don't live in a society that race is not an issue. Like, race is always an issue or always becomes an issue. And, like, you know, I don't know if, like, if it was the case, if, if they saw, like, you know, me, that they would be comfortable with taking my milk or if they will, like, use it. Like, what if they took it and they didn't use it because I was black? Like, I think that... I think I would be naive not to think that. I feel comfortable with the women who have donated to us because I feel like someone who's going to do that isn't the type of person who's going to be taking drugs, isn't the type of, I mean, they're breastfeeding their own baby with this milk. They're probably doing everything that they can to be healthy. Even when like things would get stressful, like in my mind, I would automatically think I'm gonna ruin my breast milk. Like I didn't want to transfer my tension or my stress to the baby's breast milk and give it to her. So right. I always try to keep it like, you know, I'm happy, it's gonna be okay. And <laughs> still, yeah. Okay. And that's it. Very good. Thank you so much. This is awesome. That is a lot of a lot of milk. That's great. I 
heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm going to go like an obsess and pump again. <laughs> I'm a crack fiend for breast milk. <laughs> In the early days, I know that the uh, subject of male lactation did come up in circles around us. And I think uh, Gus brought it up once or twice himself. Um, I had no interest in going down that road. Um, maybe I'm not as adventurous as some, but um, you know, it just wasn't something I felt the need to take on. I think Gus was maybe more into the idea than I was. I think it, in a weird way, I talked about it so I could get people to give us some milk. <laughs> Gus and Jesse were both really, um... They just felt really bad that they couldn't give her breast milk because there's so much out there that says how healthy it is. And it was kind of like if you know anybody that has extra breast milk, pass it over. So I had all this extra milk in my freezer and I had called someone about um, some kind of milk bag somewhere about donating it to anonymously. Yes. There you had to like get a whole form from the doctor and feel, you know, need to check up, special check up to make sure you were all right and disease free before you could donate to this milk bank. <laughs> And I knew I was disease free. I thought it would be easier just to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did Olivia, could you tell us like there was any difference in the breast milks? Like yeah. in we her reaction to We were talking about that earlier. Uh, no, but we were also saying uh, we were, that we never blended uh -huh. formula with breast milk or hey. mixed up different breast milks <laughs> together. <laughs> um, we were purists about yeah. it, so. They all had a different consistency. They were all different colors, <laughs> different <laughs> thicknesses of, you know, it just was like, it didn't seem right to mix them. You know, in some ways it's about nutrition and it's about um, the antibodies and all of that. But in another way, and maybe even in a more important way for us, it was just about the community and the support that we had mm -hmm. from all of you as we were becoming parents, you know, it was really nice. Diana is my friend. Right now, she seems to be having problems with him staying on the breast. Que yo no, nunca he dicho eso, pero yo estoy desesperada por hacerlo ya. Saca tu seno. Y lo agarra. Si lo vas a agarrar así, Tú lo pones en el medio de tu brazo, ¿verdad? Va a agarrar lo más cómodo posible, tú ves, y tú tienes control. No, él la tiene ahí, la tiene adentro, la tiene totalmente adentro el seno. Y tiene toda, la, toda esta parte, la tiene adentro. Tú ves, mira. Tú ves, mira. ¿Lo ves? Uh -huh. Tiene toda esa parte adentro. Y mi mano está libre, yo puedo hacer lo que yo quiera, y él está cómodo, y su barriguita está contra mi cuerpo. Me. Ya, mi amor, ya, mi amor. Cuando él te tenga la, 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 tú le siempre le entre ese dedito para que no te haga la dolor. Y se le saca. Si quiere, se lo vas a poner así. Que lo de tatita, yo no que lo de tatita, yo que lo mi teta. Yo quiero mi teta, yo quiero mi teta, mamá. Sí, yo quiero la mía, sí, sí, sí. I needed so much to feel like I tried everything. And we did it for a really long time. Like, I think I was still pumping at six months and still trying. And I think I finally was at seven or close to eight months when he just stopped taking to the breast at all. You know, to invest so much and to fail. It's like failure as, as a mother. Now that's like not true on all other aspects, but when it comes to that, and it's, you know, it's a little, that little thing that I keep with me that every once in a while gets a tinge. We started to supplement a little bit with 
Uh, it's, it was an organic cow's milk formula um, at about, I think it was about five months. Um, and that was really, it was really something that I think my husband felt more comfortable with than I did, but since he was staying home full time, I decided to go ahead and say okay to that because I really couldn't pump enough to, I mean, he, he felt that I wasn't pumping enough, that she was hungry. When people see you nursing, especially after you reach a certain point, people who don't understand the experience, they'll say, you're still nursing her? <laughs> like, you like it. <laughs> like, what do you mean I like it? I've kind of like looked at people like, you're sick. Like, I'm feeding my baby. Like, are you retarded? <laughs> like, that's my response, not, like, yeah, I like it, so what? Like, no. Like, I feel like I have to defend it. Like, it's not sexual, you idiot. Like, I'm feeding my baby. She preferred breast milk to formula, but there just wasn't enough. I wasn't producing enough. I think that there are women who are very successful at being able to exclusively breastfeed their children while holding down a full-time job, but I don't think that everybody can do it. And I don't think that we should beat ourselves up for not being able to do it all. We, as a culture in the United States, have decided that publicly, that making mothers feel guilty about their infant feeding methods is wrong. But we are also a culture that has not made it easy for women to be successful in some of their infant feeding choices. And so instead of actually making changes, we talk about guilt, we talk about, and we talk about how much we care about mothers, we don't want them to feel guilty, but we don't care enough about them to actually do things to change the possibilities in their experiences. So guilt operates as this rhetoric that forestalls change. And it makes it seem like anybody who talks about guilt really cares a lot about mothers. And I think it's a lie. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a discourse that serves this, this sort of s rhetorical function, but behind it is this very insidious um, maintenance of a status quo that is not good for women, and that in fact makes them feel bad about themselves. So instead of using, so in, if instead of sort of worrying about whether mothers feel guilty, we actually made changes to the culture so mothers could would be more likely to be successful in the behaviors that they're being advised to engage as mothers. I think we, you know, life would be a lot better for a lot of us. Maybe I'll just make a two egg pop for me. Good snack. Yeah. Are you gonna eat it? Yeah. Do you want to help me mix? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, but remember to be careful when you're mixing, okay? Thanks, bud. But you're hungry, aren't you? Mommy, she's gonna fix herself an omelet, and then we can nurse. A scramble. <laughs> I want milk. My milk. I want milk. I love my milk. I'm milky. Milky. Tap tip tap milk. Tap tip tap tap. I want milk. <laughs> Rufus is a tit man, sucking on his mama's gland, sucking on a nipple, it's sweeter than a ripple, why? Yeah, sweeter than a wine. You can tell by the way the boy burps that it's got to taste fine. 
Marco Polo crepe, the spice and silk and Rufus crepe, the mama's milk and no more count on nanny goat is gonna get the baby's vote. Come on, mama. Come on and open up your shirt. You got the goods, mama, give the little boy a squirt. For my lungs and for my liver, I do definitely fear. I like to suck on cigarettes and drink the wine and the beer. The doctor says I'm oral. I believe it's true. I believe it's true. Son, you look so satisfied, I envy you. So put Rufus on the left one and put me right on the right And like Romulus and Remus will suck all night Come on, Mama Come on and lactate a while Yeah, look down on us, Mama And flash us on my dollar smile Mama, flashes of Madonna's